But before we start talking of the specifics of this individual bird, let me tell you a little bit about the Wildlife Center. Now, a lot of you know us. Many of you have probably seen us on television or heard about us. But the Wildlife Center of Virginia is a teaching and research hospital for wildlife medicine. We're one of the largest and leading wildlife hospitals in the entire world. We're located in Waynesboro, Virginia. And people ask us frequently, why in Waynesboro, Virginia is the world's leading wildlife hospital built and located? And that's where I lived when I started it, and I didn't want to commute. Simple as that. You know, if you're the first guy on the job, then you get to make a lot of decisions that don't make sense later. But the Wildlife Center's been around for about 33 years. And we are, as I say, a teaching hospital, so fourth year vet students uh, from every vet school in the United States and Canada, and students and professionals from about 40 other countries travel to Virginia, to Waynesboro, spend time with us, uh, learning to apply the general skills of veterinary medicine to the very, very specific world of wildlife medicine. And my lovely colleague here, Agnes, is a veterinarian from Poland, a wildlife veterinarian from Poland, who is here uh, studying for 10 weeks, right, at, at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, and interested not only in raptors, which we're doing today, but in orthopedic surgery, which is hopefully we're going to get her to specialize, and then maybe we'll try to get her to come back. Okay, ladies, come on up here, please. You? Anywho, both of you. Is that the bucket? No. <laughs> I told her to look for the bucket. Yeah, well, th this, these are our collaborators, our, our colleagues in crime. Uh, Sabrina Garvin is the director of the Southwest Virginia Wildlife Center. Diane Durazio is the veterinarian of the Southwest Virginia Wildlife Center, and she's the one who actually came out and caught this bird and uh, brought it in to the Southwest Virginia Wildlife Center back in June. And the bird was uh, emaciated. Oh, well, you can tell it. What did you find when you found the bird? Yeah. Um, basically, it was a nestling that had gotten blown out. We'd had a bunch of storms, and she got blown out of her nest early. And we got the call and went out, and she was on the ground, um, sitting on the edge of a ravine of about maybe 20 feet down to the little creek bed there. And so we got very lucky. You know, I thought maybe when we went to get her, she was going to back up and go off that um, that ledge. Um, but there was a tree that had fallen down, and the roots were sticking into the bank. So I was able to shimmy out on that on that root and put a towel over and pick her up. And of course, my first response was, "Well, she's just sitting there." But that's what the nestlings do. You know, they hunker down. They don't really fight with you like a fledgling would. And so we got very lucky in that response. Um, in that respect. And we wrapped her up in a towel and we cast her up and put her in a dog crate. And I have to share a funny story about it because you know how golfers are. Well, we had gone in a golf cart to the back of Westlake Golf Course to get this bird. So we're coming back in a, in a golf cart and all of a sudden the person leading in the golf cart ahead of us goes, stop! And we went, <laughs> he said, they got to play through the hole. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a green there and there was a bunch of guys and he said, no, I'm serious. They'll be very mad. He said, it's an eagle. Yeah. Nope, we got to wait. Till well, we when you go through, you just tell them, hey, we got an eagle on this hole. <laughs> <laughs> so basically she was, she was really wet and um, she'd been on the ground long enough and wet enough for the flies to lay eggs and all of her feather shafts were full of Well, one of the things that has um, really been a huge, huge benefit to our region is that we have partnering organizations. We have the Southwest Virginia Wildlife Center with new facilities and uh, a team of people with whom we partner very closely, and this bird is a perfect example of that. Uh, in the Bedford, uh, Lynchburg area, we have a network of home-based rehabilitators with whom we work, and the, these are people we trust, we help train, uh, we depend on them to be our eyes and ears and go get them on the ground because the Wildlife Center of Virginia, with very, very few exceptions, we don't go out and bring in patients. We're not the rescue squad, we're the trauma center. 
and uh, each year we will treat about 2,700 animals, which doesn't, well, it sounds like a lot perhaps to you, but in the, in the world of wildlife rehabilitation centers, it's not really a huge number, but each and every one of those birds presents a window through which we can see wildlife in the environment. And as we were talking a little earlier, this bird that we're going to release today is strong enough, old enough, healthy enough, and ready to go back to the wild. And we've been already asking, you know, well, it's, how can it learn to hunt in captivity? Well, eagles have been muddling along for a few hundred thousand years, and it's pretty well hardwired into their genes. Their parents don't teach them to hunt. Big misnomers in, um, in a lot of wildlife circles that somehow they have to be taught to find food. It's hardwired. When they get hungry, they're looking for something to eat. These animals that come through the Wildlife Center, uh, both Southwest Virginia Wildlife Center and Wildlife Center Virginia, are offered a variety of foods, uh, a real uh, array of natural type foods, and so they know what food looks like when they're going back to the wild. Now, one of the challenges this bird is going to face, and perhaps the biggest challenge, is that it is hunting season. And one of the biggest problems we see in bald eagles in Virginia is lead poisoning. And that comes from scavenging the remains of animals that are hunted and left in the field. Now, a lot of people that don't like hunting say, oh, they're the hunters doing something bad again. It's not about that. It's about knowledge we didn't have and haven't had. We, I, I've been a lifelong hunter, a competitive shooter, I'm a gun collector, and I never heard about this in any of the popular media until we started seeing it in our hospital. There are simple ways to fix this, simply by encouraging hunters to switch from lead-based ammunition to non-lead-based ammunition. It's readily available, it's a little bit more expensive, and I, you know, I have people complaining, oh, it's so much more expensive to buy those copper bullets. It's like, wait a minute, you're going to the field in a $40,000 SUV, you're wearing $500 worth of camo Realtree Gore-Tex, you're shooting a $1,000 gun, and you're telling me that an extra $5 for a box of bullets is going to keep you from hunting? Not a very convincing argument. And the truth is that it's become so controversial anytime anybody mentions hunting or guns, this is just a simple thing. What we're using today to harvest game presents a toxic issue for eagles and other wildlife. You can target shoot with all the lead you want, you can compete with all the lead you want, you can defend your home with all the lead bullets. We are encouraging hunters when they go into the field to take the lead alternatives and not leave these toxic time bombs out there. 80% of the bald eagles we get at the Wildlife Center of Virginia have measurable levels of lead in their blood. Zero is normal. You shouldn't be able to test it at all. So what we're going to do uh, today, first of all, now that I see that our colleagues here from uh, the uh, Smith Mountain Lake State Park, Dave and his team over here, uh, thank you for the hospitality. Thank uh, very much to, for hosting us. We really appreciate it. Since this bird came from this area, we're happy to bring it home. Uh, I was asked earlier, you know, how long, you know, how did the birds come back to this area? And of course, the bald eagle is one of the greatest conservation success stories of all time. Uh, we picked this bird to be our national symbol in 1782 because of its fierce spirit, family orientation, defends its territory. Not a, an aggressive bird, but a bird that you don't want to mess with. And that was what we thought would be a good symbol and a good message to send to the world. So we said, this is the symbol of our country. Then we proceeded to drive it to the brink of extinction. Not a very good way to treat our symbol, but when we recognized that we were going to lose our national symbol, conservation legislation like the Endangered Species Act, some of the pesticide control laws and various Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act were all passed. The bald eagle has made a dramatic recovery. Here in Virginia, we were down to about 30 nesting pairs in 1970. Today, we don't have any idea, but it's somewhere between 1,700 and 2,000 nesting pairs. Now, bald eagles in this part of Virginia are relatively a new thing. Back when Jamestown was settled in 1607, there were thousands of eagles all based along the Chesapeake Bay and the shores of the tidal rivers. 
this part of Virginia probably had some golden eagles. Bald eagles weren't up here. We've changed the habitat, and for years we dreaded, as the bald eagle population went up and traditional habitat went down, at some point those lines were going to intersect, and as habitat continued to be destroyed, we expected the eagle population to continue back down with it. We were wrong. The eagle simply moved into new habitat and moved into what we call secondary, and this would be secondary habitat, big body of water, tall trees, and even what we call tertiary habitat, which is just not great for eagles for their natural history, being fishing birds, but they compensated by becoming scavenging birds. And that's where the lead poisoning issue has become a real big deal. So what hunters leave in the field is an important food source for them, unfortunately with lead fragments in it. A single fragment of lead the size of a grain of rice is enough to kill a bird like the one we're going to release today. So before we go on any further and before we really get down to the release stuff, does anybody have any questions either about this bird? I'll tell you what we're going to do with the bird here in a minute, but, or about the wildlife center or any of these issues. Yes, ma'am. What's her name? Uh, name Eagle. It has a number. It does not have a name. Um, and I don't even remember what the number is off the top of my head, but we don't name the animals we're releasing. Yes, sir. Territorial. How about the ones in there? How are they going with that pair? Good question. Territorial uh, parts of the bird, I mean, or the characteristics of these birds. If they don't want her around, they're going to chase this bird off pretty quick. The fact that it's a juvenile bird, the fact that this time of the year there is no nesting activity going on, those territorial things are diminished dramatically. And one of the things that we've seen over the last 30 years is that uh, where, it, where it used to be that the eagles we got in were hit by cars or gunshot or poisoned, now a very significant percentage of the eagles we receive at our hospital today are injured in territorial fights with other eagles because they're fighting for nesting territories. The population has gotten that big. Right now, this being a juvenile bird, this being a time of the year when nesting is not going on and there's no nest real close by, this bird will be fine. If, if a pair has uh, territory, they'll chase it off pretty quickly without any big deal. So that's a good question, real good question. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Will she stay here through the winter? Oh, good. Uh, what will this bird do? Will it stay through the winter or will it take off? We have no idea. The instant that bird leaves our hands, it's a wild bird with free will. And uh, we don't know, and frankly, we don't care as long as it stays out of trouble. Uh, this bird may well stay here until spring, or this bird may be in Bristol before we get back to Waynesboro. Uh, you know, it just, it, it just do we don't know, and there's no way to predict because some of the birds that we release stay around very tight to the area where they are released and the fact that this bird came from here is, is a possibility although it never flew it does not know this territory has never seen this territory other than from its nest and from the bank of that creek yes this bird has a transmitter right so you uh, are going to know where it goes i think it, yeah i, I, I honestly I, I, I haven't handled this bird before so it's going to be a surprise but yeah this bird has okay. um a cellular transmitter now this is not the technology where the satellite picks it up okay. this is one that is about the size of the deck of playing cards we'll try to show it to you and every 48 hours this bird downloads a burst of digital data that will let us know on a 15 minute increment where the bird has gone how high it has flown how fast it's flown uh, the elevation and the longitude and latitude of where it is and you will be able to go to the Wildlife Center of Virginia's website, which is wildlifecenter.org, cleverly enough, and uh, you'll be able to track this bird and know that you were here the day it was released, and you'll be able to see where it goes. So the questions about where is it going to spend the winter, it will answer those questions for us. Hey, Des, but I mean, how long do the transmitters of this type normally stay on? Don't they fall off usually? No, this bird, the, the way we put the transmitters on is using a Teflon tape. This transmitter will stay on this bird throughout its entire life. Okay. Um, some of the ones fall off. What we have found and what we have heard through studies is when those harnesses that fall away, and those are typically the satellite harnesses okay. uh, because they're a lot more expensive and uh, they want to get those back. Those things are thousands of dollars a piece. 
but when those harnesses are breaking away, they can be, present a hazard to the bird. Uh, this stays on no problem for the bird at all. It's, it uh, will ignore it and not interfere whatsoever. It's got a little solar panel on the back of the transmitter that keeps the batteries charged. The batteries are guaranteed for two years. Uh, the first bird we released with one of these on it is still sending back signals four years later. So we, we have every expectation to follow this along. Cool. Thank you. Would you like to address the crowd? I just want to thank you for coming. I want to thank the Wildlife Center and Ed for helping us and Diane. Um, without the network and the Wildlife Center, we couldn't do what we do. And when I started out of my basement, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and eventually got tied in with the Wildlife Center of Virginia. My education uh, and training has expanded and I want to thank the Wildlife Center when we have a problem, we call them. Uh, we've grown, We've uh, this year we've already taken in 1,200 animals in the Roanoke Valley. Um, we typically specialize in songbirds. Do you have anything to say, Diane? Um, well, just to add that in July we became a licensed veterinary hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Proud of that. And we're thrilled with that, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, with... Um, with this partnership, it really makes it possible for organizations to specialize. We're the teaching hospital. We get the train wrecks. We get the animals that are broken into several pieces. And uh, because we have four full-time veterinarians on staff and we are doing training, we have the capability to really go to an extreme in therapeutic care that might not be logical or cost-effective or even possible at other facilities but every animal they take in the Roanoke Valley is one less animal that ends up on our doorstep and they're able to do as good a job as we can do with any animal that they choose to keep as a patient. There's no question about that. That's right. That's right. So, all right, now, yes, hey, oh, I know you. How are you, buddy? <laughs> Listen, for the folks who may not know, would you explain why they call this a bald eagle when he is not bald? Oh, all right, yeah, those of us who are uh, becoming bald eagles in our own right. Yeah, so yeah, it's a solar panel for a love machine. That's not a bald spot, but uh, that's going to get edited out, I hope. <laughs> so, uh, I have to watch myself. You know that's live, right? That'll at least end up on a blooper reel. Uh, bald eagles get their name not because they have a bald head. And we, we occasionally get an animal that's brought in, and they say it's a bald eagle, and they get there, and it's a vulture. It's like, this is a vulture, not a bald eagle. Well, we assumed it was a bald eagle because his head is bald. Well, in the old English, bald had two meanings. B-A-L-D meant without covering. B-A-L-D-E meant white. This was the bald-headed, the white-headed eagle. If you've ever heard of a bald-faced lie, that's a lie told by a white man. That's a phrase coined by Native Americans. And so uh, there you go. So this bird is completely brown. It is not doesn't have the white head or the white tail. It does not get the mature feather coloration until it's four and a half years old. The feathers will change a little bit each year, but this time, four years from now, this bird's molt or feather change, the shedding of old feathers, the replacement with new feathers, it will come out looking like the classic white head, white tail, charcoal gray body of the bald eagle that's so iconic to, to so many people in this country. Yes, question. How long do bald eagles typically live for? Oh, good question. Longevity of a bald eagle in the wild. We have had them 28 years old that are still active breeding birds, which is just extraordinary. We know they can live up into the 30s. Uh, now, to be perfectly honest about that, this bird has a very small chance of doing that. Uh, that's a real long shot. That's not an average. The truth is that for every juvenile bird that leaves the nest, Typically, only one of three will make it to maturity to a nesting age. There are a lot of things out there that are presenting problems to bald eagles. Uh, electric wires from electrocution, collisions, automobile or vehicle collisions. We get them in hit by airplanes every year. Uh, we have all sorts of environmental contaminants. There's still criminal activity. Uh, I testify as an expert witness for the U.S. Department of Justice and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service nationwide, regularly, every year, testifying in criminal trials, people that have killed bald eagles in order to sell their feathers and parts for, to collectors. And, you know, so this bird doesn't have any guarantee of success. The best we've been able to do for this bird is guarantee it a shot at success. 
All right, now what we're going to do, the bird's over in the back of the van, so we're going to move over there, and now what uh, I'm going to ask everybody to do is let us get out in front and don't crowd around in front. We'll form sort of a semicircle from the back of the van on both sides, so I'm going to launch the bird, or we're going to launch the bird that way, down that trail, and we'll see where it goes. But before I, I do that, I, once we get the bird out, I'll walk around so everybody can see it and everybody can get a good picture and his eyes can adjust to the light because he's been in a dark box, a dark travel crate for four hours now. So uh, it's dark in his world. We're going to wake him up and, and uh, also give him a chance to look around a little bit before we just throw him up in the air. <laughs> All right? Let's go do that thing. All right, bring that over here. One of the things that um, bald eagles do, they have lots of sharp places. Uh, their, their talons can generate 500 pounds of pressure per square inch, and their beaks, they don't really generate much pressure. Uh, actually, the worst bite wound I ever had in 33 years of working with wildlife came from a cardinal that got hold of the skin between my fingers. And bear in mind, they crush seeds with their beaks. Bald eagles don't have that kind of crushing power, but their beak is sharp on the tip and sharp on the edges so they can scoop out pieces of flesh to swallow. And having had one bite me in the face at an eagle release one time, I'm really intent on just letting that be your imagination, not showing you that. Um, I'm going to reach in here and get this bird out. And then what we'll do is we'll let the crowd, we'll part the sea and let you kind of line both sides here. to go ahead and kind of fall back along the lines here and I'll walk around and let you get a look I'll start over here okay. now what we're getting ready to do is uh, something that actually just tickles me to death we uh, have often come out and had these releases and I really don't do anything with the animals other than raise the money and pass the laws and do all of the people stuff. The veterinary teams really deserve the credit. And in this case, our partners at the Southwest Virginia Wildlife Center uh, deserve the credit for retrieving this bird, giving it the emergency care, and then ultimately transferring it to us where we were able to do the rehabilitation and rearing. And so for the final release today, I'm going to ask Sabrina Garvin to do the honors, which I think will be your first eagle release. Yeah, on the back. So, so don't try, don't try not to talk to her after she's done. She won't be able to talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I tell you, because I can scarcely do it, and I've released a hundred of these birds. So come on up here and get hold of those feet. Now, we're going to need to clear out back here, come on down this way just a bit, and 
and we'll count to three as Sabrina is going to launch this bird to a life in the wild. Now, yeah, hold on. No, 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 no biting, no biting. That's, that's not nice. Not the first time been bitten. All right, back out just a little bit. My folks, stand back on the grass, please. Back up just a bit. All right, and if we can get our camera guys to scoot down just a little bit, that if you can just kneel down or something, that'd be good. That'll give you a better shot anyway. All right, are we ready? We are ready. Are you ready? All right, on the count of three, high as you can throw it straight in the air. One, two, three. Oh, that wasn't very close. Awesome! Yeah. 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 Yeah.